Good morning. Today is Yud Shvat, the tenth day of Shvat, the day of passing of the Friediger Rebbe, the previous Rebbe of Chabad, and the day in which, in 1951, the Rebbe assumed the mantle of leadership. And it is also February 1st. <coughs> and we're continuing with the essay that we're learning from Torah Or on this week's Torah portion, B'Shalach. And we were talking about the two different types of horses. And we have a lot more to say about it because we, the truth is we never read the Zohar where, where this all comes from. So the Zohar has two completely different interpretations. The Alter Rebbe here goes by the second one. But there's a first one which is tied into it also. We might look at that maybe today, tomorrow, the day after. Let's see. Okay. So, so far, we said that there is the substance and essence of God which in order to enclose, in order to engarb in this world, has to have what we call the masculine letters, which represent the descent of the godliness down into terms that the world can, can deal with, into limited, limited language. And that's what we said happened at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, and there's a description in the Prophets in Chavakuk chapter 3, verse 8, that it was as if God was uh, riding the stallions, stallions specifically, the male horses. And that is what happened when he gave the Torah, so that there would be a, an, an ability to bring down, and again, the, the masculine letters are from above to below. And then we said, but there's also the feminine letters in holiness. And what is that? Those, we said, many times is the oral tradition, but it's also, as we'll see, it's also the prayers that we say. That's also the letters that are feminine, because they're going from below to above. They're lifting us. And as a result, they bring down further masculine letters. They, they, it's as if they, um, they seduce the masculine to come down. I mean, they go up and then they say, come follow me. And the masculine comes down after the feminine. Okay, and then he said, and that's where we uh, sort of finished yesterday, um, on page 17, the, the left column, that there are also two types of letters, masculine and feminine, in the impure husks of the world, the impurity. And we said that the, mascul- that the female letters, the feminine letters, are a makif, they're a surrounding light. They're the atmosphere, and they're related to paro. And these are all the empty words that a person says during his life. And all the more so, the forbidden words that he speaks. For instance, that he slanders his uh, friend, or he speaks ill of him, and uh, he lies, he cheats, and so on. All these negative words. These are the feminine letters. And what comes down... Sorry, I didn't say this right. The feminine here is, and I said this wrong yesterday, I think also. The feminine here is is what rises. These are the empty words. What they bring down is an atmosphere of of impurity. That's the masculine letters. Um, uh, But let's see, let's see a little bit more. V'hinei paro radaf achar Yisrael bishat yitziat Mitzrayim, k'mo shkatu v'ayirdof paro. Sh'ratza l'oridu l'amshich nishmot Yisrael l'toch omek ha'klipot. Why did paro chase the Israelites when they came out of Egypt because he wanted to take their souls and bring them down into the depths of the impure husks. So says, so says uh, the Zohar, what did he do? What does it mean that he put the, the, uh, the, uh, femi- the female horses, the mares, in front and the stallions behind? That let's say they had six horses in a chariot. So the two front horses would be mares, and the, bottom four, the, the back four would be stallions, would be masculine. And then they would chase, as it were, they would chase the, the female, the mares. And that's what caused everything to move very quickly. So that's how he got to them very, very quickly. So what are the female letters doing? They're, they're causing everything to move very, very fast. That's why he put them in front. 
but this also, that, that's technically what he did. But the Zohar is not so interested in what he did technically. The Zohar is really interested in what does this signify. So says the Alter Rebbe, that what this signifies is, שעלידי זה ימשכה מלמעלה גם כן מעומק הקליפות כדרכו של איש לכבוש. He says that he created this state in which the masculine would follow the feminine. So again, wh- what's the feminine doing? The feminine is bringing them into the impure husks. And then the masculine is bringing them into the depths of the impure husk. It's, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a progress that he does here. First he grabs you a little bit with something small. And then he immerses you in it completely. Paro represents the impurity in the world. He doesn't necessarily know this or not know this. Sometimes when a person is so high up that he represents so much, then subconsciously he knows what to do. Even if he doesn't consciously know exactly what to do. The moment that he's the representative of the impurity in the world at that time, so he has like an intuition about what he needs to do. So even if he didn't know and all he was doing was trying to chase the slaves that had made their way out of Egypt and he wanted them back, but the very fact that he used this type of method of uh, putting mares in front of stallions, he says this is symbolically what, what was happening in the spiritual world was that he was representing, was giving, manifesting this process by which first you say something that is empty and then you say things that are forbidden and so on until you're finally immersed in a total atmosphere of impurity. That's, that's what usually happens to a person. <coughs> this isn't a tiny area to make a light-hearted comment at the beginning of the Shia to remind that, That's something else. That's not very betelim. There's a purpose for it. Vrim betelim is the, is the klipa of, of, the, of the element of air. That you use the air in your mouth in order to say things that are either completely nothing or that they're completely forbidden, whichever, whichever they are. But again, this is like an act that you do, one act, two acts, three acts. You say things, but then eventually it draws down the impurity from the masculine the masculine side of the impurity, and then you're immersed already. And you can't, you can't see your way out. It's very difficult. So, how'd you get out? so that's exactly what he's going to say, how, how, how you get out of this. The, 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 in Avoda, that's exactly the point. That what did God do? And so God took this, and he flipped it upside down. And he said, I can do the same thing in holiness. And so what will I have in holiness? How will it work? I also I'll first have these feminine letters, feminine, feminine letters of holiness, and they will draw down a new atmosphere, the atmosphere of holiness onto you. Okay, but you first have to have the feminine letters. So therefore, Vashem will suf so he says that Hashem went before them as a what? As a pillar of fire. Right? So that pillar of fire was the feminine. It's what they followed. So they followed the feminine. And then just before he split the sea, he did the opposite. He took it to the back, the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. He brought them to the back. And he walked behind the Jewish people as it were. So he was walking behind, now, now the feminine is behind the masculine. Now they're moving forward. Okay, so, couldn't have done that. what do you mean Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't have done that? He can't move the Shekhinah. Hashem had to move the Shekhinah. In any case, So first, so this is a very big principle, that whenever you want to understand what this means in, in a person's psychology, so you first have to have the Torah picture very clear. By the way, I, I'll just say in short, uh, the, the first interpretation the Zohar gives is that Paro didn't have any mares. He only had stallions. And so what, did he do? what happened? That it's talking actually about drawing them into the sea. So the Zohar says that God seemed, he brought the Shekhinah down, his presence was took the form 
of a mare. And so the stallions followed it into the Red Sea, and that's where they drowned. Meaning that he, that he seduced them to come into it in order to drown them. It's a very different picture. Right? Because here, the, 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 the very uh, presence, the divine presence, takes on the form of the feminine. It's not that Paro had feminine horses, female mirrors. And so that, that needs more thought. What, what does that exactly mean? What does it mean that the divine presence is willing to take on the image of a female horse and seduce the, uh, the masculine horses of, the, of Paro? So the first thing that comes to mind is that in a certain sense that's something that happens many times in Torah. But the place where it happens the clearest is in Megillah Sester. Is in the scroll of Esther. There we see that the Shechina was Esther, and she went into Achashverus's uh, Artaxerxes' uh, palace and seduced him to come after her. And that was how she saved. She caused Haman to drown, right? Because all she had to do was that now Haman was like trying to uh, uh, usurp uh, Achashverus's uh, place. And that's what led to his demise. So we see that the, this female entrapment is a, <laughs> is a common theme. It's not something... But it, it, needs, it needs more thought. What does that mean, actually, in, the, in, the, in Panemius, in, in the person's uh, psyche? In any case, here he's going to explain now, So if we understood the principle here, the Torah principle, then we can look now into the psyche and see how it works there. Israel. Page 18. Every Jew should experience within himself the exodus from Egypt and the splitting of the Red Sea every day in, in himself. That's what we, we, it's not the same verse that we saw last week, but it's similar. So that you remember the exodus from Egypt every day of your life. So they too didn't know where. Um, where this is from, where does it, where do the sages say this? That on every day it should be as if today you came out of Egypt. Have you ever heard such a statement? Yeah, it's a rash. That every day, yeah. no. Yeah. Because every day you should feel the Torah is given anew. It says that about about the giving of the Torah, because the giving of the Torah. I don't remember that. You show me, because. The, the, the simple reasoning is okay, we'll, we'll look later. Simple reasoning is because the giving of the Torah is an eternal act. It didn't just happen once, it happens every single day. It's like what the sages say Every day, a echo comes out of uh, the mountain of uh, Sinai, meaning uh, where the Torah was given, and it calls out to everyone, Woe is you! Um, from the embarrassment of you should have from the Torah because you don't keep it because you don't follow it and so on. So it's a, the, the giving of the Torah is understood as an eternal event. It happens as it were every single day. It's what we call omnipresent. It's omnipresent not just in space. It's also omnipresent in time. It's like if if you understand correctly what the giving of the Torah was, you see that it's something that's happening in every moment. It wasn't just a one-time event. But about coming out of Egypt, that doesn't, on the contrary, we say we have to remember the coming out of Egypt, because it's not an eternal event. It was a one-time event in history, and every time we have to remember it. So I, I don't know about this thing today, Ken, he says, every day it should be as if today you came out of, out of Egypt. That, that doesn't, in, to my knowledge, uh, relate to uh, the Exodus. And we say every day, he says the, we have a mitzvah every day to remember the coming, coming out of Egypt. That's what the third um, portion of the Shema is about. And then just after Shema in the morning um, prayers, we also say, and you split the sea for them. So we see that that also has to be every day. You know, a person has to remember these two things every day, that he came out of Egypt, and that God split the sea. 
All the worlds that are not pure godliness, they are known as Egypt. They're called Egypt, which means a narrow strait. Because they are a limited reality. So all the worlds are a limited reality relative to godliness. As the sages say, that from here to the next spiritual world, called the firmament, it's 500 years of walking. As if you, if you would walk for 500 years, that's the that's distance. And as we say, that the world is destined to be 6,000 years. So it has a limited time. So again, all these things we want to say that the worlds are limited. Whenever you talk about worlds, even spiritual worlds, we're talking about something that's limited. What does it mean to be an exile in these, in these worlds, in these physical worlds that we live in? To be an exile is to be, um, to be in, an, in, in, an, in an Egyptian exile. You're in a state of exile within Egypt. What does it mean that this Egypt has a king? Melech Mitzrayim, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. So he says that the king is the logic, the thought, the intellect. The intellect of why it's a good thing to have an expensive car, the intellect of why you should have this and you should have that, you should live your life this way and this way. All the different reasonings that attach a person to the vanity of this world. That is what's called the king of Egypt. The king of, of the limited worlds. The king of the limited worlds is, you know, the advertising companies. They know why you need all these things. So they tell you what you need, and you follow them. Because you, you, you're a servant in Egypt still. You, you, you're in a, in a state of slavery in Egypt. And we'll continue tomorrow.